Welcome back to the broadcast. I have a very, very special guest here, someone that I look up to. I've often, often re relayed to y'all the story about how I went and did research and found my oldest relative. And uh, again, again, his name was Thos King. Come to find out he was on a plantation called the King Plantation in Virginia. And turns out that was a breeding farm. Now, most African-Americans are not familiar with this whole idea of breeding farms. And so I got that idea from, or not idea, but I got that knowledge, that information from listening to someone that, in my opinion, is probably the greatest find of Black America, uh, at least as far as I'm concerned, over the past five or 10 years. We've been looking for these great scholars. And some of us say, hey, they're not here anymore but he's been right in front of us. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce to everyone to Dr. Gerald Horn. Doctor, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you so much for your time. How are you today, sir? Thank you for inviting me. It's all good. Yes, sir. Okay. So for you all who don't know, I want to just quickly introduce you to Dr. Gerald Horn. And correct me, doctor, if I'm correct, he's originally from St. Louis, Missouri. He has his bachelor's degree from Princeton, a PhD from Columbia, and also, right, a JD from California, Berkeley. So that right there, <laughs> you know, appreciate that. I know that to me that like, wow, that's amazing. You have a PhD and a JD. In addition to that, um, he is a professor at the our, one of our local universities here, the University of Houston. Uh, doctor, I don't want to hold you up too long. I know you have a, a, a very busy schedule. So I want to just get straight to it. Thank you, everybody. Everybody in the chat room, show your appreciation. Type in Dr. Gerald Horn in the chat room. Make sure you show that. And, and I want you to go and, and search him on, on YouTube because there is a brilliant, brilliant body of work out there that you all need to investigate. Now, Doc, straight to the point. Um, we got a lot of wild theories here on the Internet. OK, and I brought you in kind of to help us dispel some of that. Can you please explain to us, you know, as basic as you can for, for my broad audience, the transatlantic slave trade and how we went from there to these breeding farms that we have here, that we had in the United States? The floor is yours, doctor. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, yes, there was a transatlantic slave trade. In fact, there was not only a, a transatlantic slave trade from Africa to the Caribbean and North America, there was also a trade in enslaved Africans northward from particularly what is now the Sudan into Turkey. And there was also a trade in enslaved Africans eastward into what is now Iraq, going as far as Mauritius, which is this archipelago in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Part of the problem with Africa is location. <laughs> that is to say, it was being preyed upon by all of these uh, neighbors, not least Europe, which brings us to the transatlantic slave trade, which is a product generally of the post-1492 era. 1492, of course, being the era inaugurated by the freebooter Christopher Columbus when he encounters the Caribbean uh, in the late 15th century. Now, I understand why many Black people in the United States are in denial about the existence of the slave trade, because I guess they feel that it does not speak well for them that they come from people who were enslaved. But I think that that's a misunderstanding. Uh, number one, if you look at world history, uh, fundamentally, uh, every group on planet Earth has been subjected to slavery at one time or another. Now, admittedly, the slave trade that the Africans were involved in post-1492 was more horrific, more devastating, etc. But I guess that, that only speaks to the point of why people try to uh, skip, try to evade having any sort of identification with it. I mean, I think that if you deny the existence of the transatlantic slave trade, fundamentally, you're saying that you're against reparations <laughs> because right. if there was no slave trade, why, what are you doing demanding reparations? Uh, that doesn't make any sense. 
And so uh, I, I think that if you deny the slave trade, you're also denying the essential role that black people's free labor played in the development of this so-called superpower uh, known as the United States of America, which US patriots claim is the most powerful country that's ever existed. Well, if you don't understand centuries of free labor, well, then you can't even understand that basic elementary fact. So with regard to breeding farms, which I know is a, is a particular yes. interest, uh, your audience should know, uh, I allude to that in my book on Brazil, which deals with the role of U.S. nationals and the slave trade to Brazil, because as you know, Brazil has a larger black population than that in the United States, the largest black population this side of Nigeria. And what happens is that largely responsible for that were U.S. nationals, because in the 1830s and 1840s in particular, they were trying to control the slave trade, not by going into Angola and Mozambique, which had been the historic pattern, but by breeding Africans, not least in Virginia, and then shipping them to Brazil. Now, my understanding is, is that outside of Richmond, Virginia, uh, you still can see visually, phenotypically, uh, these lighter skinned Negro communities, which are a product of that time, because of course, needless to say, the breeding of Africans did not only mean, hey Shaquille, hey Beyonce, go to it. It also meant enslavers deciding to produce profits by rape. And that leads us to another point, which is that I don't think you can begin to understand the demented culture that exists and persists in this country, particularly vis-a-vis -vis women, without understanding the demented patterns that were in existence about, let's say, 150 years ago. So, so can, and I want to back up a little bit. Can you talk to us, and we've talked about this on, on this broadcast, what role did the Africans on the African continent play in the transatlantic slave trade to the United States? And when I say that, I mean, did the Africans know that they were trading Africans into slavery who were going to end up in, in what was then, you know, the Western hemisphere? And to what degree, in other words, using a legal term, what culpability did they have as from the perspective of harm as related to who owes black Americans reparations? Well, let me answer that in a number of ways. Uh, number one, uh, many, of those who were sold into slavery in the Americas and the Caribbean were either prisoners of war or descendants of prisoners of war. And that trade in prisoners of war, once again, was not necessarily unique uh, to Africans. It existed to, to a greater or lesser degree all over the world. Secondly, with regard to culpability, you have to make two points. Number one, that Europeans, not least British, French, Portuguese, and Spanish, were in control of the slave trade. But number two, uh, there were Africans who were assisting them. However, what you need to realize is that we use this term African, I use this term African, but fundamentally, oftentimes what was happening is that people saw each other by their different ethnic groups. That is to say, they may have been an Igbo, and they did not necessarily identify with a Hausa or did not necessarily identify with a Yoruba. In fact, uh, what I'm doing now is explaining today's Nigeria, where that sort of pattern uh, still persists. So when we use that phrase, they were selling their people into slavery, that's a 21st century formulation. It does not necessarily correspond with the facts on the ground. And I know that this came up with regard to The Woman King, the movie that, that I have to confess I haven't seen yet. Okay. So it's, it's difficult for, have you seen it? I have, I have unfortunately had the occasion to watch this movie. Mm -hmm. And um, 
it's almost as if they're trying to get African Americans to root and cheer for our enslavers or those who participate. Right? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, <laughs> I had, <laughs> as I said, I had Judge uh, Judge Joe Brown on here the other day, and it's just a term of respect. But Professor, yeah, basically they're trying to paint the Dahomey tribe as anti. Uh, in slavery, when in actuality, history reveals that they were knee deep in in the slave trade and they participated in it. But you may be able to, I'm sure you can elaborate on that. Uh, and I think you actually have talked about that on some of your broadcasts. <clears throat> I'd like to ask you another question. <clears throat> um, I have a theory and, and, and you have an illegal background, i.e. your JD. My objective as an attorney, when I'm suing for someone who's caused harm is to make my client whole. That's right. It, it does not matter to me which defendant pays. Matter of fact, we have a saying, sue them all and let the judge sort them out, which is kind of we, you know, take away from, you know, some some war chants uh, about, you know, let let the Lord sort them out. But whether it's an African tribe, which is now taken over by a nation, that nation then inheriting the debts and the assets of that former tribe whether it's a European corporation or bank or insurance company or some American corporation, dot, 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 sue them all and let them figure out amongst themselves who's going to pay you. I have no issue suing a, an African, what is now an African country or democracy or republic, and then letting them figure out how much they owe based on the fact that after 1808, when slavery became illegal, they still benefited and profited from slavery. Now, here's the trick. Before 1808, slavery was legal. It was legal pretty much everywhere. It was even legal in the African continent. So let's say if I was to file my hypothetical reparations lawsuit, the, the judge is going to say, no, I'm going to allow defense counsel to dismiss this on the grounds that slavery was legal. Therefore, this is a 12B6 motion to dismiss for failure to state a, grant, uh, a, a claim upon which relief can be granted because it was legal at the time. But after 1808, you got relatives, let's say, who came here in a ship from Ghana or Nigeria or Togo Benin, and now you have a claim under this, this, this uh, 1808 Anti-Slavery Act. What are your general thoughts on that? And I know that's a lot in there, but what are your thoughts, Your Honor? Well, uh, I would look at this strategically. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is that given the fact that a reparations claim is fundamentally a political claim, mm -hmm. particularly if you're talking about suing in the courts in the United States of America, which have tipped so dangerously and perilously to the right. Yeah. And so we're basically talking about politics. And when we're talking about politics, then we may want to make the determination that at least in the short term, we're going to unite with, say, the African Union to press claims against Washington, London, Lisbon, Paris, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps after we triumph, then we can sue <laughs> Togo, <laughs> Benin, <laughs> right. et, et cetera. Yes, but sir. I don't think because if we triumph, that means that the pol the politics have changed. That right. means that we're in a much more advantageous political position. Right. So strategically, if if I were the chief of litigation uh, for this planned lawsuit, that would be my strategy. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you some questions, and I know you're going to be like, "This is silly. Why am I even being bothered with answering these questions?" But rampant here on these YouTube streets are a lot of wild theories about where Africans came from. So there's one, there's a religion that has developed that says the only Africans taken were Africans who were from Egypt and they were actually Jewish or Hebrews who then ran away from Egypt and ended up in West Africa who were then kidnapped and then brought to America. I don't want to name the religion, but, and then you got another cohort of people saying, oh, no, we were never transported over here. How do you get from 400,000 to 4 million? Oh, no, we were already in the America. Look at what Christopher Columbus said. He said, look at these dark-skinned people. Now, I know you've addressed this before on some of your, 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 uh, your, 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 your conversations that you've had with other folks, but can you please help dispel some of these 
ridiculous notions because I think the worst thing we could do is allow folks to continue, especially black Americans, to continue to be misled by what I have, I have no better word to call them than charlatans. If you will, can you please address those two from a historical perspective, uh, Dr. Horn? First of all, uh, as you know, there's been a lot of research on pre-1492 African presence in the Americas. Oftentimes people look at these Olmec statues that are still persistent in Mexico. Ivan, the late Ivan Van Sertema wrote an entire book that came before Columbus. And it's, it is true that there are escalator-like currents that uh, can propel one across the Atlantic, just like uh, if you uh, look at a documentary like Contiki, K-O-N hyphen T-I-K-I, that talks about the possibility of uh, Melanesians and Polynesians uh, mm. sailing uh, westward. Melanesians, of course, look like yourself and myself, except that they're in the South Seas. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Fiji, Solomon Islands. You might have seen the White House just had a, a meeting uh, of these folks just the other day because mm -hmm. they're trying to round up a posse to go out to China. Yes, Your Honor. Having said that, uh, I don't think we should use that to evade the point that there was a transatlantic slave trade post-1492, there are tremendous records because these people, they kept records because they didn't see anything wrong with it. And that's why we know how many people were roughly were transported, how many died. We know that disproportionately they came from places like Angola and Congo, and that after there was a crackdown on the slave trade post-1808, the enslavers sailed around the Cape to Mozambique and to Zanzibar and began transporting them from there. With regard to Egypt, uh, I have a special point to make, and I have to make this my last point. Yes, Your Honor. In, I mean, uh, uh, Doc. <laughs> latest book, okay. Counter Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery and Jim Crow and the Roots of U.S. Fascism. I talk about the point that when the U.S. Civil War was taking place, 1861 to 1865, U.S. was preoccupied. France takes over Mexico and put a puppet Maximilian in office. Maximilian is being besieged. He works out a deal with Egypt to send Africans to Mexico to fight on his behalf. All of them don't return. Some of them, I speculate in this book, it's all documented, okay. uh, might have wound up in Texas. Maybe they're still in Mexico. And perhaps it was from that particular point of someone being related to one of these Egyptian fighters post 1861, 1862, perhaps then they just jumped to the conclusion that all of us are related uh, to Egyptians. But in any case, uh, Brother Sperling, I look forward to returning uh, to yes. your program. And how do we, to you and your future endeavors? How do we get your books? I want to do that. I want to, I want to, because I, I, I actually have your Amazon page up here and you have a lot of books. And so I'd like to know, how do we get, how do we buy your books? Is, is Amazon what you suggest we go through? Or is there another route that we should or, choose? Or you can order through your favorite black bookstore or, okay. I mean, I, it's hard enough to write these books, so I'm not involved in selling them and marketing them. <laughs> I want you all, everybody here, this is Dr. Gerald, Gerald Horn's catalog here. Just look at this extensive, and, and I got one book, okay? I'm counting right here just on this one screen. This is nine, this, look at this. This is a national treasure. I would hope that you all would take the opportunity to, to not only go on YouTube, but also to find these books, Fill yourself with this knowledge so that we don't have charlatans who are misleading you. We need to begin to value education and those, these great minds like Dr. Horn who are available. And now you can even, you can read the books and see him in live action and describe the, the, the content. This is, this is better than, 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 this is the best it's gonna get. Again, Dr. Horn, I wanna just thank you so much. You're welcome back anytime. Please, the next time you write a book, I'd love for you to come back and talk about your books. I actually began to order some of your books here. 
myself and there's just so many to read i'm only ordering three at a time because i know if I, I stack up I'll, I'll just sit in the corner and and gain dust but thank you so much dr horn is there anything else you'd like to say to the audience i know there's probably about ten thousand people who are going to see this uh what would you like to say as far as history and your love of history and or, or, or something like that to motivate these folks here well uh, i think that if you look at many of the people who we admire. Let's look at Malcolm X, for example. Uh, we all know the story about what happened to Malcolm X when he was in prison. Mm -hmm. He embarked upon a reading regime, and that reading regime helped to liberate his mind mm -hmm. and then ultimately contributed to the liberation of Black people. And so I think in a microcosmic sense, uh, what happened to him uh, should be replicated amongst many of us. You may not be able to uh, transport yourself into liberating a, a people, but you can certainly liberate yourself. You can liberate your children. You can liberate your family, your neighbors, your church members, et cetera. So thank you for inviting me, and I look thank forward you. to returning. Thank you so much, Dr. Ari. Everybody, y'all hit the number one button for Dr. Horn. Thank you so much, Dr. Horn. We'll talk to you soon. All right. <laughs> okay, good good luck. Thank you so much. Hey you guys, let's welcome Dr. Horn. We're gonna take a uh we want to appreciate Dr. Horn for for his 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 appearance here. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey, if you're enjoying the content here at Dennis Sperling Unfiltered, make sure you support it by like, sharing, and subscribing to the channel. And also hit that little notification bell in the corner so that you'll get notice of each and every one of our live feeds. Man, we had Dr. Joe Horn here. Shout out to Dr. Joe Horn. Uh, Green Gorilla, man, welcome on in. Come on in, man. Help me out. I don't think the folks realize who we had here today. Uh, I only had him for a brief time period. My fault. I got home late from work. And so I had to, uh, you know, I had to do what I had to do here to get him in. But I know that's why we're a lot, a lot earlier than we normally are. Green Gorilla, man, how are you doing? Uh, hey, the G with going? the PhD. Hey, man, we had Dr. Gerald Horn here, man. How about that? That's awesome, man. That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, that's so, a that's a giant right there in the academy, I know, man. I know, man. What are your thoughts on uh, what he said briefly? You know, you see where I was trying to go, man. We got a lot of people on the internet saying a lot of wild things, a lot of wild theories, misleading folks. And yeah. uh, I, I just, I try not to stay out of, I try to stay out of that, but you know, when I can get an expert, uh, you know, like Dr. You know, Gerald Horn to come in and say, no, we're not Indians. And I understand why you would be ashamed to be slaves, but understand that everybody in this this world that we live in has slave ancestry just because how pervasive it was. How does that affect, how does that allow you to then take that ammunition and go forward and continue dispelling the ignorance that we have here? Go ahead, the floor is yours. Well, you know, uh, like what uh, Dr. Horn was saying about Ivan Van Sertema and the various Afrocentric theorists who've come up, you know, and written, they, they've written so many books to just demonstrate that, yes, mm -hmm. it is the case that Africans immigrated to the Americas prior mm -hmm. to the transatlantic slave trade. It doesn't deny the transatlantic slave trade. Right. It just it, it just doesn't. I mean, you know, the bulk, I'm talking about millions upon millions of people were mm -hmm. transported from uh, Africa to the Americas during the transatlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. And they came to more places. I mean, say, for example, Mexico. There were more slaves that were brought to Mexico and Brazil than there were actually to the United States. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are just the facts. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, they just, they, they're parochial. They don't really study a lot, so they don't really know a lot about the history mm -hmm. of that, you know, uh, the the immigration of black folks, you know, to the various portions or places mm -hmm. in America or in the Americas, if I, if I, if I were uh, to, to be more accurate. Mm -hmm. But um, th the reality is, is that the bulk of us came here during that, that time frame, the transatlantic slave uh, time frame. We, we probably weren't uh, ancient Egyptian immigrants and uh, basically helped to, the Olmecs developed their culture or civilization. It, it, you know, it's just, it's more likely, probabilistically, that we were part of that group of persons who were brought over between yeah. 1500 and 1800. It's just, it's just the facts. Yeah. 
Yeah. The other thing is, like he mentioned briefly the breeding farms. You can go through his catalog on the internet and he will talk more about that. But basically he explains that we had breeding farms in Baltimore, Virginia, and South Carolina where what? And it, it was part of the industry. Like he said, Beyonce, you get with Shaquille, y'all make a baby. Basically we're saying they would make, take the biggest and the strongest Africans and they would breed them, but they would also interject themselves into it. You know, like the, the white slave owners, because they didn't see a problem with it. And that's why you have pockets of light skinned white folks, light skinned black people outside of Virginia. I don't think many African Americans are aware of these breeding farms. What are your thoughts on that? And is that something that we, we, we should talk about? I think it's important. But what are your thoughts on it? Another fact, you know, uh, about black persons in America is that we're a hybridized population. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are just the facts. So, I mean, you know, there aren't too many African-Americans that have the same features and phenotypes as that of Africans. I mean, I'm not to say that we, you know, there aren't black people in America who are like almost genetically uh, pure Africans because there are like, I mean, you know, there've been DNA studies and tests uh, done on various celebrities mm -hmm. to demonstrate that some of them, you know, like Oprah Winfrey, for example, she, you know, she's almost uh, non-hybrid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, I mean, the vast majority of African Americans in relation to their ancestry have European and African ancestry. Right. Uh, not so, I mean, this whole Native American ancestry thing, I, I get it, I understand it, but the vast majority of African Americans don't, don't have this Native American ancestry that they keep claiming that they do. And that, like, you, you you're... you're lightness and your fairness of hair more than likely is a result of you uh you know being interbred with uh or some white man having interbred with a black woman right it just right. it just and you know they created all of these categories of blackness uh it, but in different countries it may have been more obsessive but we yeah. had our quadroons and our octoroons uh here as well so i mean you know and let's face it man i mean you know some black women look really damn good, or some of these half breed women look good, man. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not trying to be ignorant by saying that, but I'm pretty yeah. sure, like some of these half breed women, caught yeah. the eye of, of you know these rich white boys, yeah. and, and I mean it's these breeding farms as well as the auction block were a perfect place for uh you know these these rich white boys. To, to engage in prostitution and sexual mm -hmm. debauchery. I mean, it was, mm -hmm. it, I mean, they would think about what the auction, the slave auction was like for these people. They get to poke and pride at you. They get to look at your genitals. They get to, you know, uh, you know, inspect you and, and, and defile you and berate you and humiliate you. I mean, it, it's almost like foreplay for these people. You right. know what I'm saying? But I mean, the, but the reality is we're a hybridized population, but yeah. I want to add a sidebar to that, and uh, well, I want to you know put an addendum to that. Some of these uh, people that call themselves Latino, mm -hmm. they're a hybridized population also. Mm -hmm. They don't think it, you know, because like going back to what Dr. Horn was saying, S Spain was a major player in the slave trade, right. but it just so happens that they came to the Americas, and I I'm not gonna say they enslaved. Uh, the Native Americans, but uh, to some degree that they, they did, they colon they definitely colonized them, and they definitely definitely annexed their land. But a lot of these people that call themselves Latinos really are actually part of the Native American population that have interbred with white people as well and speak mm -hmm. a slave language, just like African Americans speak a slave language, English. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's just it's important for people to understand the truth. Uh, but you know, man, the, here's you know, the, here's the thing, like. I, you know, as an attorney and, and you know, as a as a, a, a doctor yourself, I think and, and, I, and I'm sure Dr. Tia San Johnson feels the same way and all the folks who like ourselves, who have not just education, but the higher education. I think we have an obligation to try to dispel some of these these misnomers. You know, our people suffer from a lack of knowledge our people suffer basically our people suffer from ignorance and then i think it's our job to combat this ignorance and 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 i 
I, I don't think we should just continue allowing this to just go forward. You got, and you know, I, I respect everybody's religion. You know, I get it. Whatever gets you up in the morning and gets you going. But at the point where you're saying things that truly fly in the face of what history, like Dr. Dr. Horn said, they, they got ramp, they got rampant, uh, 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 plentiful documentation on the transatlantic slave trade, both on this cult, both on this side and uh, in Africa and all throughout Europe. Why do we still allow people to say, oh no, we were uh, people from Egypt who were uh, enslaved and then we migrated to, uh, to the west coast of Africa where those people there, we're not like them, we're not Africans like them, oh no, we're, we're Hebrew, you see what I mean? To me, that's just another play on I'm not black, I'm Indian because I'm, you know, and, and that goes more to say I'm ashamed of what my true history is as a black person, you know, as an African-American. I got people who come on here and say, oh, I'm not black. And I'm like, but I'm looking at you. You you are black American. Oh, oh, but what is black? We're, you know, and it's like it, it, then we get into the linguistics of it and the it's like, what are your, it, all this confusion is not good, man. That's my thought. What are your thoughts on this? And I know we don't want to call anybody out. People entitled to believe what they want, but what are your thoughts on that? Man, you know, it's a mixed bag for me, you know, although, <laughs> I'm, you know, although I'm not in the business of uh, telling people what they can and what they can't believe. Mm -hmm. I mean, I believe you should exercise autonomy and come to, uh, you know, the truth as you see it on your own terms, but for the most part, based upon study, erudition, and reflection, yeah. uh, you know, as opposed to based upon uh, faith and uh, just, you know, blind, yeah. uh, you know, theological speculation. Right. Uh, uh, you know, I, but I've been through that, man. You know, like I, I've, I've gone to Catholic schools all my life, man. So, you know, mm -hmm. I started off indoctrinated as a person who had to believe in something uh, right. lest, lest I burn an eternal damnation. Now, mm. I mean, you know, and that, that has a, a powerful impact on the psyche, you know, this, this yeah. you know, religion does. Um, but when you, you know, look, I can see it if it, if it creates, you know, uh, liberatory tension in your soul to where you want to fight back. You know, I, yeah. if you, if you want to believe that, you know, you, you want to be liberated because, uh, you feel like some wrongdoing has been done to you and that, you know, it's going to lead to some eschatological fight in the end. More power to you. But, I mean, at the same time, you can't ex expect for people to deny the archival evidence. Because, it, I mean, they got, like, his, they got logs of, of prisoners, you know what I'm saying? Right. Or they got logs of people that they purchased, you mm -hmm. know, to, to bring over here. So So to deny that, to me is to, uh, you know, almost deny that the earth is round, you know, because you can't actually, you know, I mean, people, man, they have funny beliefs, man. I, you know, and I'm not here to change anybody's mind, uh, but I am, you know, I am here to say, I, I will argue with an individual, but I, you know, I'm not going to argue with fools. I'm just, I'm not about to, I'm not about to engage in that practice, but I do no. understand, you know, the, the whole idea about being, or setting yourself up as the chosen or the elect. I have no issue with that, mm -hmm. okay? Because um, most religion is fantastical anyway. I mean, you, <laughs> what, I yeah. mean, not to be ignorant, but I mean, you know, the idea that, you know, I, I'd rather, you know, black people walk around and perceive themselves as the chosen ones than to yeah. believe that a group of Europeans are the chosen ones. I, I mean, you know, I, so, I, so, I, so, I, so I it's a it. It's a mix. It. It's a mixed yeah. bag for me. You know what I mean. But right. I, but I'd much prefer mm -hmm. uh, our people to believe that they're the elect and the chosen ones, and that they're mm -hmm. going to inherit the kingdom of, of God, than than uh you know, I, some white boy somewhere who uh just co opted the religion for themselves. And and but I will say this though, you know, historically, uh, I think that you know black black folks have a greater claim to uh you know the ancestry that that's in the bible than mm -hmm. some some european some you know eastern european people man like oh yeah yeah I, I, I mean you know i'm just saying like you know if i if i were to dig through you know my archives and look at my history books and even just uh -huh. reading the bible 
and seeing where most of the events took place. I mean, shit, none of them took place in Eastern Europe, man. <laughs> right, right. It's you a know? Little, it's a little too hot in those places that they that they did take place for those folk to be. <laughs> to, well, I mean, you know, they, they, yeah. So I mean, some of it took place in Rome, uh-huh. but I mean, you know, like nothing took place, you know, in. Uh, Eastern Europe, as far as you know, it, it, my knowledge uh, is concerned. Like, I mean, like what? Yeah. You know, they, yeah. we talk about Mount Zion. Where is that? Mm-hmm. It ain't in Eastern Europe. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's not. So, so the thing is, and I'm glad you're here. Um, I, I, I guess you know, I kind of wanted to. I, I've been doing this reparations thing because I'm tired of people complaining about it. Like, I hate complainers. You know, it's, at some point, let's just do something about it. So Dr. Gerald Horn says, hey, sue the European countries, get the African countries on your side and fight about it. Uh, that's definitely something we should consider. You know, if we really want, if you really want reparations, it's it's going to have to happen in somebody's courtroom somewhere because they're clearly not going to give it up. And um, I just want to set a precedent. I want to get something on the books. You know, that's kind of where I am. And whether or not it's a 100% win or, or even an L, like Plessy versus Ferguson, I just want to get something on the books so we can set a precedent and move from there. What are your thoughts on, on the idea of reparations for black Americans? And when I say black Americans, I'm referring to African people who were brought here, um, during the transatlantic slave trade and can trace their heritage back to what we know as traditional South or mid Atlantic, uh, and, 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 and slavery. What, what are your thoughts? Do you think it's a fool's errand? You think it's outdated? Do you think no way in hell? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think we even deserve it? What are your thoughts? Man, I've been saying we need reparations. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, but, but like Dr. Horn was saying, reparations is more a, a political issue than it is a legal issue, although it is a, a political issue that needs to play, uh, take place in the legal domain. What do you uh, think he meant by that? I'm going to interpret that Ph.D. talk and tell everybody, what did he mean by political? In, 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 go, go ahead. Well, I mean, just using basic common sense, bro. Mm-hmm. I mean, like. First of all, laws are constructs that men make up. So, I mean, you you know, you had an idea because I know you you know you study law. So there's an mm-hmm. idea of positive law, and, and then there's natural law, and then there's divine law. I mean, there's mm-hmm. d- different ideas about where the law emanates from, or like what what tethers it, and you know what is it based upon. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like, I mean, going back to 1808. You know, like that's America, right? And, right. and it's anti-slavery abolition act. Then you had, you know, uh, England that developed its own uh, particular anti-slavery act. Um, but the question is, you know, these are all just like arbitrary edicts, you know, or laws, yeah. you know, developed by, uh, you know, politicians. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, how do you, you know, like, at, at, at some point, how do you, you know, determine, okay, well, this, this country can be, you know, basically held accountable for something that everybody else was doing mm-hmm. through, through the annals of time, you know, but, but as far as I'm concerned, look, if, if America wants to exhibit goodwill and if they really actually are willing to put their money where their mouth is and to live up to their own creed, they mm-hmm. ought to be, you know, apologetic, show contrition, because reparations is not just a monetary act, right. okay? It is an acknowledgement of, reform. it's a formal legal acknowledgement of wrongdoing and a dedicated effort to redress injustice such that, you know, the relationship between two populations of persons or ethnic groups or religious groups so that that, that relationship can be remedied. Right. But you, you already know, man, like, I mean, the re, in relation to the, the reality, I mean, do these, are these people actually going to do, you know, what they ought to do in that I, regard? I, I doubt it, but. You I, know, I, I'm looking at it like this. Nobody's going to give us reparations. 
Um, matter of fact, we're never going to get the amount of reparations we're due dollar for dollar for the labor for our ancestors or the, uh, what we had to endure. I think there are going to be a select few people if they push the issue legally. They could have some viable claims and they could actually get reparations. But for the 40 some odd million African Americans of, of who are descended from the slave trade in America, I don't think it's I don't think it's possible. Reparations for all these folks and the amount of money and the interest that would break America. And that serves us no purpose either. Um, but but Dennis, one, Dennis, one thing they could do, brother, mm -hmm. is they could begin to stop marginalizing us at the present mm -hmm. moment. Like, and then also what they could do is they could repair for some of the, the harm that they've done, mm -hmm. you know, in relation to housing, uh, uh, loans and lending, inclusion in professions and education. They can stop mm -hmm. the over-criminalizing of black people, particularly black males. There's a lot that they could do. Mm -hmm. they, I mean, that it wouldn't necessarily create this, you know, like humongous transfer of, uh, of funding, but still yeah. could, you know, ameliorate the condition of their own citizens. Because after all, we are American citizens. We pay taxes, just like every damn body else in this country. Okay? All right, so so uh, I, let's let's have this conversation, and, and I'm just going to, gloves are off, right? Let's just have an honest conversation. It's me and Gigi. I got my rum and my cigar, and I'm going to be completely honest from my perspective. If black folks start getting treated like white folks get treated right now, white folks would want to be treated better. OK, yeah. in other words, there is a need to have an underclass in this country. There is a need for the people on top to say, hey, I'm better than those people. And so because I'm at least better than those people, I'll settle for the crumbs that you're giving me. The vast majority of white men and women in the United States are broke as shit. OK, excuse the language, but they're broke. They're overworked. Uh, they're stressed out. The thing they have going on for them is they could look at black people and say, hey, at least I'm better than those folks over there. And if not financially, I'm a better human being because this religion that we, 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 we worship called white survivalism says that I am. And it goes back to, to uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who says as long as uh, you can convince a white man that he's better than black men or black people, then he'll do whatever you say do, basically. And so what happens when you begin to start correcting some of these past wrongs and the GI Bill, the land grab that happened uh, at the end of the Civil War, then now you got black people on the even footing. You know, the reason white folks move out of black neighborhoods, when, white, when, when black people move in, at least this was something that, that happened previously uh, that I saw firsthand, is because when you move next to white folks, that makes them feel bad. It makes them feel as though they're not as successful because now they're living amongst black people who may think they're better than, or who've been brainwashed to believe that they're better in, at least in this country. So it's a way, the system is set up in that way that you, know, you would literally have, look at what's going on right now. This whole uh, January 6th thing is because white folks have been brainwashed to believe that they should be better than everybody else. And the minute it looks like black folks or people of color are getting toehold in, uh, you know, in, in the mountain of success, higher and above what they've been had, it, it makes white folks who've been brainwashed, you know, go uh, berserk. Yeah, yeah so let me... the system is set up the way it is for a reason. Yeah, you know, ever since uh, Bacon's Rebellion and the uh, solidification of race as a as a means of de determining hierarchy in the United States, you really haven't seen, uh, uh you know, a deep seated black white alliance, you know, amongst mm. the populist, you know, like the the run of the mill average everyday right. black person and white person. You really haven't seen uh, that kind of coalition, and mm. uh, you know they would they you know rich white people are clever man. They know how to balkanize. And to create, you know, superficial divisions amongst people in order, to, you know, to, to have the attention drawn away from them to people, you know, beneath them. Let you let you all fight over the scraps as long as you don't draw attention to us 
and, and create a, an issue for us while we, right. you know, while we play puppet master, you know, uh, and uh, continue to reap the benefits economically and uh, legally uh, as they see fit. So I, I get it. Yeah. Uh, but it would be uh, it would be intelligent for them, you know, especially white folks that don't have a lot. I mean, you know, like white people in Appalachia, uh, Trump appealed to them for some reason. But I mean, you know, like Dave Chappelle cleverly pointed out, he was like, look, man, Dave Chappelle is is looking out for people in my tax bracket. Right. Not you, white boy. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? Like, not you. Yeah. He's not looking out for you, mm-hmm. even though he'll talk to talk. You know, but he, as it pertains to uh, you know looking looking out for the the average, you know forty to sixty thousand uh, dollar, you know uh, income individual in America, that's no, most politicians aren't looking out for that, uh, you know that demographic. I mean, you know, America's a dollarocracy, man. It's a yeah. it's a corporatocracy, yeah. and so uh, you know I, mm-hmm. I say that, and, and I know a lot of people say that, you know, but. Uh, the reality is, is that uh, the corporations, you know, like the, the, these politicians are eager to ensure that they, they curry favor with them. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, they'll, you know, the capital, they call it capital strike. Capital will walk out. They'll walk out of a city. They'll walk out of a state and threaten to go elsewhere. And so, uh, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, what the corporations say goes, you know, yeah. uh, but, but, you know, at, at some point that's. That's why, you know, the left used to be about, you know, economics. Right. But but now the left has become, since uh, the Civil Rights Act and Title VII legislation have become, you know, the big thing, like they've kind of dropped economics and now it's all about sex, you know, related issues. And, and, and race has become like, you know, pushed to, to the background. Uh yeah. Because, um, like, let's just face it: white women are the biggest beneficiaries of Title VII or the Civil Rights Act. It, it just is what it is. Now, I'm not trying to, you know, you got to get it when it getting this good. I, you know, if, if that's, you know, how you feel, you know, like you're gonna squeeze or, or wring the towel until you can draw all of the uh, moisture out of it. I mean, you know, that works for you, but in the end, it doesn't work for us. It's not work. Title Seven or the Civil Rights Act, the, an act that was intended to work for us, it just doesn't. You know, it works for white women, and now it works for you know, uh, you know, the LGBTQ community and, and, and anybody else who comes along. They're mm-hmm. able to utilize that framework that was intended for us uh, for themselves, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, I think it's a tragedy. And not to say that there aren't you know uh, black people who are also members of that community, right? But, I mean, let's think about it. Like, what does gay rights get the average gay black person? Not very much. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they might be able to get married, but, you know, when white folks get married, you know, they got benefits and they're able to maintain wealth. Well, you know, they they, they have a, they have a, a baseline. You know, they have grandparents that were allowed to receive loans when black people weren't. Uh, black people were, you know, you know about the redlining where the banks got together and say, we're not, we're not going to make loans to people in this community over here. And back in the day, those communities were delegated to just black people. In other words, segregation wouldn't allow you to move to a white neighborhood. And only if you were able to live in one of those neighborhoods where white people were, would you be granted a home loan? So what does that mean? Restricted that relegates you to a rental class. That means you can only rent property. You know, but thing I want to talk about, and I'm going to have this conversation because I've had an opportunity to um, examine this uh, Netflix movie called Dahmer the Monster. And I'm going to talk about this more probably, um, I'll say, uh, Friday. And I'm going to explain to folks, based on what I see, what this whole religion of white supremacy, which is really just white survivalism, you know, um, and, and there's a young lady on the internet, Crimson Cure, who, who I heard, first heard say that it, it, we always talk about black inferiority and what white supremacy racism has done to black people. But what the pressure that it's put on white men specifically and white women is astounding. And it's the reason I think why they have so many issues, why they have 
so much pressure put upon them, you know, because you're expected to be a Superman. You're expected to produce no matter what. And I could see why it would cause for you to go literally crazy because the competition over there to be top dog is ridiculous. And now you got men of color who are outdoing you. Imagine this, you've been taught your whole life that you're better than that little nappy headed black boy, or you're better than that, 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 that Mexican over here, you know, who just got here from uh, overseas. But then in six or seven years, their house is bigger than yours. Their bank accounts are, are bigger. They have, they live more beautiful lives than you. And on top of that, they seem to get all the women and all the accolades and all the glory. You see how something like that would drive you crazy? If you were taught that you're better than these people and here you're looking at them being better than you, I think there's a psychological term for that uh, when, when your reality, when your, your, your perception doesn't rat, uh, match reality. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, look, man. Uh, white people, put, you know, they painted themselves into the corner with this white oh, supremacist stuff, man. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. like the, you know, the idea that they have to be ubermensch. Uh, you know, they they constantly, you know, like one of the scholars who, uh, you know, who who has since been, I guess, canceled to some degree in the academy. You mm -hmm. know, Francis Cress Wilson talked about this all of the time. You know, like right. that. The idea that you know these, this is a group of people who have like a psychosocial delusion going on. I mean, uh, yeah. but, I mean, there have been philosophers who've talked about this as well. Like Charles Mills talked about uh, white people having an inverted epistemology, meaning that they don't really see the world uh, for what it really is and and how they are really acting in the position that they occupy in it. They just don't really see the truth because right. they've created all of these lies in order to. Uh, to stop, you know, uh, themselves from having to come to terms with, with, with the reality uh, yeah. of what they've done and, and what it costs to keep mm -hmm. up the, the program that they've, they've got going. But, like, look, people are people, man. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whiteness is a construct just as much as blackness is. Now, now ethnicity, yeah. one could argue, is also a construct to some degree or the other. But, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, p politically, it's real. Like, whiteness has taken a toll on white folks and it is it's th there's nobody who's absolutely pure in relation to their you know like in, in the long run there's nobody going to be pure and untouched in this place man you, you know, know like, I, oh, go ahead go ahead doctor i, I apologize for that no go no ahead. you you good i mean like i mean the idea that you have to maintain your purity and be untainted <laughs> you know, throughout the annals of time, but you already, you know, yeah. you're a minority on the planet. Right. Like there's, yeah. there's no way for you to preserve this mm -hmm. in the long game. It just, it's not going to happen. So, uh, you know, yeah. either you get with the program, man, and, and understand it. You know, as a species, there's a spectrum of of humanity, and like mm -hmm. you don't have to claim whiteness. Like th there's a, a guy. Well, there's two people who wrote books. Uh, I think mm -hmm. uh, Irvin Nail. Urban Painter wrote one book, and there was a, another gu uh, guy who wrote a book called uh, The Invention of Whites, or, the, you mm -hmm. know, The Invention of the White Race, or something like that. I can't even remember what his name is, but uh, he talks about how, you know, this 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 whole idea of being white, it's, it's, it's insane, man. Yeah. You know, it's insane, and, and it creates yeah. a lot of stress for them people, man. Like, you yeah. know. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, and you talked about it in the terms of a sinking ship, because we seem to have a lot of what I call black radical feminists who are all on board with, you know, with, with everything that they're receiving from what is tantamount to a sinking ship. You know, when I look back at history, you know, Africans, Asians, uh, what we know as Asians now, they ruled the world for thousands and thousands of years and they had uh, all sorts of civilizations Western culture has only been around, well, at least here in the United States, it's only been around for 500 years, more or less. And it's, I already see it deteriorating. You know, look at the moral fiber, look at the families falling apart. You know, I see it being taken over by stronger, more family-oriented cultures. Latino culture is coming up from, from the bottom, taking over. And, you know, Western culture, as we know it, is kind of fading out because there's not things holding it together. Uh, but we got these strong radical feminists who are holding on to it and the gifts that it is give them, giving them or giving them, i.e. feminism, as if that's going to last. You know, like 
it's only here because you got these white dudes protecting you. You know, you and, and they realize, and, and I, it's got a lot, I got a lot of white dudes following me. They realize it, it's a bunch of crap. They realize they messed up when they let white women come in with feminism. And now they're abandoning their own white women for women in Southeast Asia and, and other places because they're trying to get away with it. They're not getting married. So how do we begin to re-educate these strong black feminists, these radical black feminists who have bit into this apple of, uh, uh, of radical feminism in your in your estimation? Take that apart as any way, any way you so choose. Bro, you know, I'm not trying to change them because <laughs> <laughs> like I mean, you know, you you can take a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And I, you know, yeah. I, I I've already casted my pearls before swine in so many different occasions. It's like, mm -hmm. look, black feminists for the most part were able to utilize the Civil Rights Act in order to basically dovetail what white women were doing. Okay, wow. so I mean, it, 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 and and it's no secret. I mean, I think that, you know, people like Tommy Curry have demonstrated, like, you know, rather convincingly that the, uh, and he's not the only one. But I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, the idea is that who are the biggest beneficiaries of civil rights legislation? You know, it, it's it's white women. And then mm -hmm. then after that came gay folks and, and black women to some degree are able to share into or, you know, to receive boons that all women do from this piece of legislation. But I mean, think about it. It just doesn't do very much for black men, and mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, at the at the present moment, that's all the left has is this the Civil Rights Act, and they're like trying to squeeze as much as they can out of it. Now, black men, they have to ask themselves, like in relation to the Democratic Party, what are we getting from the Civil Rights Act? Now, I'm not saying there's nothing that we don't get from it, but I mean, it's been pretty much countermanded by the '94 Crime Bill. Right. Like, I mean, that was something that left came up with. I'm not, you know, not to say that, you know, the people on the right haven't been in the practice of doing what they can to ensure that the black population is surveilled and, you know, brought under criminal purview. Not to, I'm not absolving them, uh, you know, absolving them of any culpability at all. But I mean, for crying out loud, it was Biden, Clinton, you know, including Hillary, who mm -hmm. doubled down on this 94 crime bill, which helped to ramp up, you know, uh, the incarceration of damn near one third of the black male population. And not to say that, you know, it, they are solely responsible, but I mean, they're, they're responsible for, you know, I guess injecting, you know, a shot of caffeine into the, to the practice. I mean, you know, you know, and yeah. And the thing is, you know, you and I live through that. You know, you and I are that generation. We we live through that, man. Like, I can remember a time in the 1970s when we had fathers and we had uncles and there wasn't crack houses right next door. I remember that time. It was a short time because I was born in the mid-70s. And, you know, from 70 to like 83, 84, life was good. But somewhere around about 85 to about 91, it just went to hell in a handbasket. And that had a lot to do with the so-called war on drugs, which is in reality when the CIA began to, CIA began to exchange dope for guns and brought folk uh, into the United, uh, brought it into the United States. And then the trap was, we'll, we'll get them in here, we'll get them selling dope and smoking dope, and then we'll put them in jail for life. We'll call that a felony, and then we'll put them in jail for life uh, uh, under the three strikes rule. That's a trap to me. That's a 94 crime bill, man. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, do do black men get anything from government? Yeah, we get the, we get the 94 crime bill. Now, this, the Civil Rights Act is the second Civil Rights Act in America because the first Civil Rights Act was Eight directly million. after the Civil War. Okay? Right. And yeah. I think that that was a prime moment in American history. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for us to actually have been ushered into full participation socially and politically mm -hmm. in, in what the country has to offer. I mean, bygones could have been bygones. No need for reparations. Like, okay, look, from this point on, we're going to cease and desist. We're trying to subjugate you, humiliate you, uh, exploit you, and uh, dehumanize you. Right. But, you know, they, they made a decision. 
you know, uh, they, they and me and uh, Sand Dog and the Nameless Protagonist were doing a series on this. Like they couldn't let it go. They just mm. they could not let it go. They had to, they had to, you know, issue in the Invisible Empire. They had to create the Jim Crow laws. They had to continue their practice of, of, of exploitation through sharecropping. It, it was a prime moment in American history where they could have just let bygones be bygones and say, okay, look. You're human like the rest of us. You're an American citizen like the rest of us. We're gonna we're gonna leave you alone. We're not gonna hamper your development, or see, or you know or restrict yeah. your ability to to flourish. See but the problem. Go ahead, doctor. Go ahead, doctor. No, no, you go ahead. You go ahead. No, I was gonna say the problem with that is just what Dr. Gerald Horn has already explained to us, and I've said it here on several occasions. There was never in any intention to have a permanent population of Africans in this country who are descended from, from the, the uh, slave trade. And I just heard a conversation with Dr. Horn, and if he would hear, he would say what I'm repeating, that even after, uh, hell, even during the Civil War, Lincoln was negotiating with places like Brazil and other place, places to get rid of the black American population. Uh, throughout this country's history, it did everything it could to get rid of us. And now what we see now, the 94 crime bill, uh, regentrification, all these other things, it is the government's policies trying to get rid of us. We are an annoyance to them that have been around and they've been trying to get rid of us for a while. This is what I see. And here's the problem. And here's, here's the crux of it. And I believe BGS Itmore has talked about I don't see a future past another 50 years with 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 amalgamation and you know interracial <coughs> relationships and even breeding with other Africans who are, who are coming from other places what we know now as an African American culture is going to be lost it's oh, not going to be go, you know that's what I see you African -American know American culture was already lost man after the civil rights act yeah. Like you, you, mm -hmm. you had like one last hurrah of black nationalism in the seventies, mm -hmm. and uh, you know it all became about integrationism mm -hmm. and uh, you know assimilationism, and uh, so you know like I put a video out there a long time ago about uh, Brenda Verner, and uh, she basically was trying to maintain some semblance of black traditionalism, whatever that whatever that is. I mean, yeah, but, but the whole point is, uh, you know, African American culture, man, is really American culture anyway. Uh, however, the political consciousness of black people at this particular juncture is absolutely absurd to me, man. We like I feel like we're off our rocker and we lost our mind. We think we think that we're being included, and and even like, black women think that they're being included, mm -hmm. and that they're being you know somehow you know uh, given access to the to this project but you know like look at the end of the day they getting chitlins and hog malls <laughs> and pig feet from title seven but the, the yeah. biggest beneficiaries of the act are white women it just it is what it is and i understand you know their desire to uh you know get it while they're getting this good while everybody's trying to squeeze as much as they can out of the civil rights act but black men have to stand up and say hey hey wait a minute look the Civil Rights Act is not really working for us. It was intended for us. It was intended for black men and women to, you know, to be given some, you know, some relief from mm -hmm. uh, Jim Crow and from uh, racial terrorism. But I mean, <laughs> unfortunately, you know, when women were basically regarded, white women in particular, were regarded as a minority and they based most of their, you know, their own politics on the actual lived lives of black folks in the United States, then I mean, you know, they they just open the door, man. Like I mean, it, this I, this is the way I think of this thing, right? I think of oppression and domination is like a bubble in a carpet. I said this on many mm. different occasions. You step on that shit in one location, excuse my French. You step on the bubble in one location, what does it do? It just moves to a different location in the uh, carpet. Unless you can get it to the edge of the carpet, that bubble ain't going nowhere. You what, understand? So so here's the thing, Doc, and and like. You know, th this is just you and I talking. I, I mean, this is what uh, I want everybody who's listening to understand the brilliance that you have here. Um, you know, we of course we had the Dr. Horn here, but you got a lawyer, a thoughtful person who who 
speaks enough or talks to you guys enough that you kind of already know where I'm coming from. And then you have uh, the G with the PhD, uh, a brother who is a learned brother, a knowledgeable brother, a highly educated, thoughtful man. And we've both come to the same conclusion. And I've never met him personally. <laughs> you see what I mean? Like, I've never sat down at, at you know, at, at his his home, a family home, and have the same conversation. But we're all, we've all come to the same conclusion that in a short time, a relatively short time period, what we know as the Black American community and culture will be absorbed into American culture. So this is almost like our last stand. How should we go out? Should we go out fighting or should we go out quietly into the night? And which is more beneficial to us? That's what I want to know from you, Gigi. Go, go, let, let's first we do this. Y'all type Green Gorilla in the chat room and type uh, 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 Dr. Dr. Gerald Horn in the chat room and y'all hit the number one button, man. But that's what I want to know. How, how should we fight this? Should we keep trying to fight and then knowing that, you know, our own sons are not even dating within the African American race, which means it's over and we just keep fighting for it until we dissipate? I mean, or should we just go quietly into the night? I don't know. What are your, what's your philosophy on that? Man, that's also a mixed bag, right? Because <laughs> although, you know, although one could argue that African American identity is becoming attenuated. Mm -hmm. You know, because of, uh, you know, our basically amalgamation and indoctrination with the American political project, mm -hmm. we still are not treated like the average white person is in the United States. So, I mean, whether you whether you want to. Yeah, yeah. Do we do we want to be treated? Look at our reputation as black Americans. Why do we want to be called black Americans anymore? Look, let's just type in black American on the Internet. We don't get Thurgood Marshall and. And and uh, 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 Coretta Scott King and Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. When you type in Black American right now, you get a gold mouth tattoo rapper with skinny jeans on and purple hair and maybe a skirt. That's what that's the image that is associated with what is now Black American. It's like the 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 lowest rung of, of black life is now has, has a, um, has a, has, has a lock, a monopoly on the image of black Americans. So I see now why so many young people are running away from that, you know? Well, so, I mean, how do, do we want that? I, I'm just asking, I'm just being the devil's advocate here. Do we want to even identify as black American? I mean, think about it. You got dudes saying we Indian, we were over here. They don't even want to be identified as black American. I get it. But in reality, when you look at that image, look at us now. We're not, we're not the Elijah Muhammad people. You know, we're not the people that came up that, that Dr. Martin Luther King fought for, Medgar Evers. We are a whole different kind of people, in my opinion. Beat me up for that, man. Go ahead and shoot me down and tell me why I'm wrong. Give me some hope. Give everybody some hope. Man, I can't really, you know, look, all I can do is just tell you how I think, right? Mm -hmm. You know, Carter G. Woodson, man, wrote a book a long time ago called The Miseducation of the Negro, you know? And uh, ultimately, you know, one of the things he lamented was that, you know, black people go to these European schools and they learn all about European history, but they mm -hmm. don't learn about their own history, okay? And, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, the whole lionization of the pimp, the player, and the dope pusher, you know, is basically anachronistic anyway that's a throwback to the 70s and the 80s you know like mm -hmm. uh and uh, you know kind of like a, a a reflection of what was happening during you know the the, the, the crack era or whatever the right. case may be but dude like what's the what's the new game plan because that that's not gonna last forever they already cracking down on rappers the so-called black americans that you're talking about they got the rico act so the, 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 the <laughs> i've been seeing that man it kind of snuck up on me yeah, and so I'm you like, can man. you can want to be like these young thugs and uh, you know these y, what they call it uh, YN Mellies and all that. You can try man. to be like one of these drill rap cats, but at the man. end of the day, they got the Rico Act for you, man. And the Rico Act ain't nothing to play with. So you let know? me let me. I want to since you brought that up, I want to kind of explain to my audience what Rico is. It's and, and it's an acronym. Rico stands for this. It, it stands for racketeering. Hold on a minute, Rico. 
I'm a, I want to get it down. They talk this heavy into Lane, Racketeering Influence and Corruption, uh, Corrupt Organizations Act. It originally came out in the 1970s. And basically, before this, we had an, an issue with organized crime. Dead what mafia, I mean, man. the mafia, the Italian mafia, the Jewish mafia, uh, the Irish mafia, you had, they were so well organized that the people on top who were actually making decisions could never be touched. And the reason they couldn't be touched is because they would have they would issue an order to a, 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 an underboss who would then issue orders to a captain who would then issue an order to soldiers who would then issue an order to associates or affiliates who would then go out and commit the crime or, or a criminal act. So you never really could get to the bosses. And in, 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 in uh, New York, they had five families, these five bosses, uh, you know, five families loosely organized, they call them. La Cosa Nostra, which means our thing in Italian or uh, our little thing. So basically, they could, you could, uh, a soldier could go to jail, an associate could go to jail, but the criminal enterprise continues forward. So now what they said is under the uh, Racketeering Influence and Corruption Organization, uh, they were able to begin to prosecute up the chain or up the pyramid. Um, and, and actually uh, indict bosses uh, for the activities of their soldiers and their associates under that particular act. So what that did was they were able to use that to break up the mob because it makes no sense to arrest some low guy who is, you know, one of, you know, maybe three or 4,000 people involved in this crime. And so now what they're doing and what the Green Gorilla is, the G with the PhD is explaining to you, now you got rappers who take their rap money and they go put uh, some they go put some money on the street to some guys who sell dope and now the money comes back to them. But now not only are they getting a the dude who sell the dope, now they're indicting them under these RICO acts. So now that's why your favorite rapper and his team are all going to the penitentiary for murders, drug sales, robberies, and all sorts of stuff. So. This is what they're doing. And that's what that's that's what GG is that's what he's explaining to you is happening. Like uh, what was the cash money? Cash money wouldn't be able to exist anymore. Um, who else? Uh Master P, his his team wouldn't have been able to exist, not under what's going on right now, because they they would be prosecuted under the Federal RICO Act. Uh GG, please continue. I just wanted to lay that foundation so they could understand. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, ultimately what I'm saying is, man, you know, the young guys, hey, bro, look, man, first of all, like, the average black gang or criminal enterprise is not as organized as La Cosa Nostra was. It just right. it just ain't, you know what I'm saying? Like, ain't no, there's not too many black people in criminal enterprises who have investments in hotels and casinos in Las Vegas. I mean, like, I mean, you know, and don't have themselves, uh, you know, nestled into uh, police departments and uh, unions on in coastal cities, you know, basically controlling docks and things like this uh, or construction yeah. projects. It, it, but what you know, what little foothold black do black people do have in the illicit market in relation to drugs in the community, like they, you know, they're using this act, this RICO act, yeah. in order to lean down hard on these boys. But you know, uh, unfortunately, and this is. This one thing I will say, and I have to just put it out there, and I know a lot of people are going to you know, think I'm making an excuse for black folks, but mm -hmm. look, the reality is, is white people use and deal drugs more than black people ever have in this country. Definitely. I mean, those are the facts, but black people get prosecuted more for dealing and using drugs, okay? And black people don't even use the same kind of hard drugs that white people do. Like, you're, you're more likely to find, uh, it, it's changing, though, because, you know, a lot of these young guys, or claiming to uh, be on Molly and lean and stuff like that. But uh, mm -hmm. white people use drugs more than black people do, man. And they deal drugs more than black people do, okay? Yeah. But we get prosecuted more for it. But, you know, that's just a function of racism. But at yeah. the end of the day, man, I you know, I put a video out there uh, maybe about four or five months ago, man, from MF Doom called Rap Snitches Canicious. Mm -hmm. and, and, and basically it's like, look, the, the, the main hook of the song is like rap snitches, telling all their business. 
you know, be in the courtroom, be their own star witness. Mm. You telling everything you're doing in your rap music. You you telling the whole world that you got connections to the street, that you'll kill somebody, and that you got like a million dollars worth of dope. That's just like that's like if you're a bad boy, real bad boys move in silence, man. Yeah. That's just the reality of the situation. But these guys, man, they want they don't they don't really want if if they part of a criminal enterprise, they don't want to be a criminal. They just want you know, what they perceive to be the trappings associated with being a bad guy, which is stupid. That's the, the exact opposite of what being a bad guy is. A bad guy is, is like Kaiser Sosie. <laughs> you know, yeah, and, and, and if you want to look at a, 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 an issue, the mafia, the Italian mafia went on undetected for decades. And it wasn't until they got flamboyant and started exposing their hands. They got big, of course. But it was people like John Gotti, who was actually the boss of the Gambino family. You know, he was too flamboyant. He had a nickname in the press. He was on Time Magazine and New York Times. And that, you know, you're you're waving it, you're waving it in the face of uh of these people who ride to work in four Tauruses. And, you know, <laughs> you're you're a criminal. Their design, their job is to prosecute you, the prosecutor's office. Uh there's a gentleman that you all may not know of. His name was Rudy Giuliani, Rudolph Giuliani. He ended up becoming the mayor, but he he got famous for prosecuting the Italian mafia, people like John Gotti. And so making all that noise is what got them uh, put in prison. Now, I don't advocate uh, by any means any criminal activity, but what I'm saying is, you know, you you, you just make yourself a target. And that's what a lot of these rappers are doing when they broadcast that that their criminal acts in their in in their music. Um, yeah, another, the another yeah, another yeah. guy who uh, was a little bit flamboyant was Joe Colombo. You know what I'm ah. saying? Mm -hmm. Doing doing mm -hmm. you know, everybody in the mob is like, hey man, you need to calm down. All this you know anti Italian organization that you got out there. I mean, you, you're putting yourself on the front street. Mm -hmm. You know, we got this criminal enterprise here. Right. You know, uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, man, you know, like KRS once said a long a time ago, man, like illegal business controls America, man. Like, but it's a lot right. of Elliot Nesses out here, man. It's a lot of, you know, guys who are like posse comitatus. We're going to put all the evildoers, we're going to lock them all away. Yeah. Uh, but, but you know, uh, you know, my view on this is you're always going to have crime. There's no way that you can, right. you know, get rid of crime. And personally... I think, you know, like the, the drug laws in America are, they're quixotic, too idealistic. You're not going to get people to stop using dope. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't, I know you've said something to the contrary on several occasions. I respect your opinion, but like at the end of the day, man, dope has always been in America, man. You, it, like the, in the, the, the Harlem Renaissance era in the 30s, the 40s and 50s, heroin was big. Half of the jazz artists were on dope. Uh, you know, like you, you're not gonna get rid of dope, man. Dope is Amer it's America, man. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Like, yeah, I, you, I, I, I agree with that. Yeah. But what they, what they need to do is decriminalize this stuff, right? But I mean, of course, if they yeah. de it, one of the main reasons that they came up with all of these drug laws to begin with was to is an it was an excuse to lock, you know, the ethnic groups that they didn't like up. So so uh, Mexicans were associated with marijuana. Cocaine was and heroin were associated. Well, heroin was actually associated with Chinese people, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, cocaine was associated mm -hmm. with black folks. And yeah. you know, and they use all of this hyperbolic language uh, in Congress to talk about how you know they're gonna hurt white women. It's always somebody just like this is a funny thing and the funniest thing in the world to me, man. How a group of racist white dudes because they are they're the original rapists, man. I mean, I, mean, mm -hmm. I, I hate to use the R word here. Well, like, I, I, mean, think, I think Genghis Khan would disagree with you on that. Well, I mean, well, well, I, I get what you're talking about, but I mean, let's you, you talked about <laughs> right. you, you talked about breeding farms earlier, you yeah. know, like, and we talk about how African Americans are a hybridized population. Like, yeah. I mean, the reality is, these people don't want want to happen to them what they done did to everybody else, man. Well, That's you know, just those are the, the those Dr. are the facts, man. What what Doctor Horn said, like everybody's ethnicity group had to deal with some form of slavery what we call europeans africans asians most of us are derived from slave because slavery has been part 
hell, slavery still exists, but it's been part of the human existence since hell. You had, you know, more people than you needed and more work, uh, you know, that needed to be done. But the thing I want to talk about here, I want to get you your opinion on this. Van Varner, he brought up something I've been thinking of. And this kind of incorporates the notion of passport bros. And that's been a hot topic here on these YouTube streets. You got people saying, I'm getting my passport, I'm leaving. You know, Gigi, I personally don't care why people go overseas. I just want them to go overseas so that they can see that there are other places they can be. You know, the brother who I just had up, he said, why don't black people just cut their losses and leave? Here's my thing. And y'all hit the number one button. I want to make sure we got, we have nobody, this is, this is a shame that I can get five or 600 people in here talking about gobbledygook and goop and foolishness. And when I have these legitimate, brilliant men in here, you know, we barely got 200 folks in here. Okay. That's, that's a shame. And it confirms what I think about my people that you love to wallow in slop. I'm just going to say it like that. You don't want knowledge. You want to, you want to be entertained. When I'm in here talking loud and cussing and screaming at y'all, cool. When I got two PhDs, one world renowned, and our very own uh, G with the PhD, y'all ain't know where to be seen. That's just a shame. I'm just telling you, in my opinion. Nevertheless, I don't think we can get justice in this country, Gigi. I think we are a people that was never intended to be in this country. And I get it. We helped build the country through force. It's not like we did it willingly. Uh, we did help fight, you know, for every major war we fought. I get it. So we helped preserve the freedom. But they don't want us here, Gigi. Why don't we take our passports and go somewhere else? I mean, wouldn't it be better if we just reincorporated ourselves back, back into the black diaspora, the African diaspora? Wouldn't that be better? Even if you want, don't want to go to Africa, there's so many other places you can go, and the generations that come behind you won't uh, be, you have to deal with that that legacy, it wouldn't it be better for that to be a forgotten legacy? What are your thoughts? And that's a philosophical question, Gigi. Man, uh, what look, are your thoughts? Man, look, man, don't be parochial, be cosmopolitan, man. Get out. If you have the, <laughs> if you had the capacity to get out and see the world, get out and see yeah. the world. And you don't have to, you know, uh, cash your net directly where you are, you know, in terms of building a family if you don't want to. Mm -hmm. There's options out here for you, man. If you don't yeah. like what, you know, if you don't like what's at McDonald's, man, you get to go to Burger King, and if you want to eat some fine cuisine, man, go, you know, to a nice Brazilian steakhouse or something like that. You ain't got no. to, you know, you don't have to holler at Shaniqua and build a family with Shaniqua if Shaniqua ain't trying to build a family. If if she wants to be the boss, you know, and wants to run and dictate everything predicated upon her idea, how things are supposed to go, and you got a different vision, hey, man, you don't have to deal with it. You just don't. There are options out here for you. It's just I'm the reality, man. I'm gonna give you a, I don't know if this is a verb or an adjective, but <laughs> uh, uh, Judge Joe Brown was over here and he referred to them as the rise of the gorillas, the girl gorillas, okay? <laughs> the rise of the girl gorillas. I swear to God, I broke out laughing. I've been <laughs> laughing about that all week. So even the older brothers, cause I was like, look, man, I know the type of women you had in your presence back when you was in yeah, UCLA in the late sixties and the early seventies. We don't have that judge you see what i mean we don't have those type of women we got women who you know they're more focused on their makeup and how much money they can get out of you than being mothers and wives they've been taught to be strong independent i don't need a man women they would rather fight you than than submit to you and so he said yeah that's the right and on top of that black american women have a higher rate of incarceration rate per capita than black american men they're rising Whereas crime amongst black men is, is going down. And I've been talking about this for two and a half years. It's going up. How do we even find suitable mates? Now I'm not saying there aren't suitable mates out there, but realistically, man, I don't want a woman who's had a hundred bodies to, to be the mother of my children. I don't want a woman who has propensity of violence, who can't control her mouth, who, who thinks uh, it's acceptable for her to snap and get loud and belligerent and disrespectful when she can't have her way. I don't want a woman like that, man. I love black women. My 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 first wife was from the Ninth War. My my baby mama was from Jamaica, and even my lady now she's Afro Latino. So you know my thing is I love black women, and you know I just 
but I don't want to put myself in a situation where my kids are being raised by that same toxic culture. So, you know, what do we do for those of us who were raised to be like, you know, keep it real, fight the power? What do we do? Or is there no hope for this gen generation X? The disease don't care, but what about us, man? Man, look, all I can tell you is, you know, for the brothers who are nationalistic out there, man, a nation is not just comprised of men in a, engaged in, in, in physical violence. Mm -hmm. Like war is, take, it takes place on many different, you know, planes. It's psychological, it's propagandistic. It's, it takes place in the heart and the home of the people, you know, who are engaging in it. And if, you know, your partner is not willing to fight the war and they like, I don't want to hear nothing about all this black madness and, uh, you know, niggas ain't this and, you know, X, Y, and Z and it's all about me and I'm magical. Like, who wants to put up with that, man? That's just mm -hmm. not, that's not going to get us over the hump, man. You know what I'm saying? And so, I, you know, I, I talked to a brother, man, a long time ago, man, who, uh, you know, used to work as a, a biology professor in Chicago. And he said, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to understand what it's like to actually be a man, as a black man in America, that's like where you're from. Mm -hmm. You need to travel in the world, man, and go elsewhere because you won't even know what it's like to be treated like a man in America. Right. You won't even know. You won't even understand it because they treat you horribly here, man. You're under surveillance all the time because they're worried about whether or not you're going to retaliate for what was done to your population in the past. Uh, they, they, they have this strong racial antipathy against you. You know, and, uh, you know, it's just like you got to travel elsewhere to see what the world has to offer. And if, if there's if there's the potential or the possibility that you could be treated better elsewhere, why cast your net down right where you are? Like, you're not tethered to this spot, man. The earth is a big place, man. It's a, it's a huge goal, a, a globe out here, man. And, and America ain't, it's, we're, it's what we're used to. I'm not saying leave America. Don't give up your American citizenship because right. there's power associated with being an American citizen. But mm -hmm. I mean, for crying out loud, man, like, you know, it's like being on your block and not ever going outside of your block or like never having traveled past your, the state borders. Go somewhere else, man. <laughs> See what's out there. You know, like you don't have to just stay on your block. You don't have you can go to the, you know, the other side of the town. You don't have to just stay, you know, in your own geographical location. And, you know, I don't know where Dennis went, but the reality is, man, you don't have to put up with disrespect, man, and uh, you don't have to put up with derision. You, you can decide that there's something better for you elsewhere. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, that's the point where we're at right now. You got to build like the brother Ren Renard G said, build elsewhere. Do something different, you know. But yeah, man, I don't I don't know what happened to Dennis, but you know, I'm happy to uh, take on the conversation and hold it down until he gets back. But yeah, man, I, you know, I would encourage all brothers, man, if you can, try to find uh, a means by which to get your passport, man, and go out there and explore, man. A man is not supposed to be tied down to one geographical location, and he's not supposed to put all his eggs in one basket, man. He's supposed to go out there and uh, you know explore. And unfortunately, right now, we don't have the, uh, you know, the spirit to explore. We just, I guess we're afraid, but I, I guess that fear is dissolving and brothers are realizing that, you know, hey, they deserve better than what they've received. And, uh, you know, it's, it's more options out there for us to explore. Yeah, that's, that's all I can say. So Brother Dennis is coming back. He said, can you see our questions? I can see your questions, uh, Brother Salam. Allah. I, I can't see your, I can't see your questions. I had to hold it down for you while you went out there, man. For hey, man, I appreciate that, man. I had a little I minor. Got, <laughs> I, th I, thought, I, I was like, hey, man, Dennis got his cyber cybernetic passport. I guess he's, he said, ah. you know. <laughs> I had to get in the wind, man. Yeah, yeah, to get I in the wind. Gonna, I ain't going to hold you up too much longer, man. I'm, I'm glad you came through. I, you know, when you get people like Dr. Tia San John, I mean, when you get people like Dr. Uh, Judge, Judge uh, Joe Brown and 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 and, and Doctor uh, uh, Doctor the Doctor Gerald Horn in here. It's a, it takes you got to debrief. It's like when we used to go to those little meetings in in the nineties when these special speakers would come on campus. After that, you got to go somewhere and sit down and chop it up. You know what I mean? You got to talk about what he talked about. 
And uh, so that's kind of what we've done here, man. Y'all make sure y'all give a hand clap for, for uh, you know, the G with the PhD. And if I ain't done it by now, let me go check that. Because I told at least 10,000 people I wanted them to go subscribe to your channel. Did they show up or do I have to reprimand them again for that, man? Man, they gave you. you you gave me a bump, man. I went from like about seven thousand to eight thousand. You know what I'm saying? That's but I mean, okay. you know, okay. so that, that that was a bump right there, man. Uh, but right. you know, I'm yeah. you know, look, man. I'm I'm on YouTube sporadically now. I'm gonna start getting back into it a little bit more. Uh, but uh, you know, like the the topics that I want to discuss, man. You know, I like I. Hey, women are an issue, man. But what I don't like to do, man, is to dwell on on talking about you know interpersonal and uh, mm -hmm. intimate relationships. Outside yeah. of the context of policy, and outside of the context of ideology, I don't mm -hmm. like. I, I could care less about, you know, going through the intricacies of dating and mating incessantly. Yeah. You know, like I, I just, yeah. you know, I, I just ain't got time. For I, I I can't do it either, man. I, that's why I talk about other things. But you see, when I have brilliant minds on here, we get 138 people. Let me talk about. Uh, let me talk about what these thoughts are doing. You see oh, what I mean? Yeah. Oh, we, we, we six, seven hundred deep up in here. But look, let me tell y'all this, okay? This is the green gorilla that you've heard speaking for the past uh, hour. And this is his channel right here. It's easy to find. The link is right here. I'm going to put it over here in the chat room right now. I want y'all to go over there. Let's get him to 10,000 before the end of this month. So that means there's going to be probably at least I don't know anywhere from six to seven thousand people who join this channel, and, and look at this this broadcast. So I want you all to make sure you go over here. All right, look at the look at the extent the extensive conversations this man is having. Uh, you know, it's not us; it's them. Reconstruction, the dark side of transgender politics, Apex Legends. That's some uh, bullshit right there, but yeah. Okay, you know, but uh, New Orleans uh, bounce. I put, I put I put music up there, man, like you uh -huh. do as well, man. You know, uh -huh. I just it's a full immersive channel, man. I put, yeah. but most of the content is, uh, you know, about social and political issues pertaining to black men. I'm a black masculinist. Yeah. I fight for uh, issues and I fight for mm -hmm. policy that's going to ameliorate the condition of black men and boys' lives, man. Especially, yeah. you know, post Civil Rights Act, which was supposed to be for us, but which, you know, the benefits of which, you know, we just don't see. It's like being invited to a party, but as soon as you get to the door, they don't let you inside of the party, man. And everybody else inside, getting down to the latest tunes, they drinking nice, they eat nice inside yeah. of the party, and they telling you, you gotta stand outside, that we not sure your name is on the list. I'm like, oh no, man! I'm I'm the one to set the party up. Yeah. What's up? Why why can't I get in here? So, at, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, man. So tomorrow, uh, I'm gonna do a show with Dr. Johnson. We're gonna talk mm -hmm. more in depth about the uh, 94 crime bill, and mm -hmm. uh, and Friday we're gonna talk more about uh, the Ku Klux Klan and what what was occurring during the Jim Crow era and mm -hmm. some of the things that prevented our capacity to be able to fully participate. Cause I mean, you know, like the, the average narrative out here is that black men are conquered. Mm -hmm. uh, they're kind of shiftless and lazy. Uh, they don't really put too much effort into their own improvement. But right. if you if you look at the historical facts, man, black men have done everything that they have could to uh, try to secure the future for us. And uh, it's just, we've, we've reached a juncture where the, the game has changed. It's like stepping on the, the, the bubble in the carpet, the game changed and we don't know how to adapt to it. But like spaces like this is, mm -hmm. is great because the narrative of the mainstream media will keep you mired in a certain narrative. But brothers right. are like, you know, they're clinging to social media now and they're talking and having conversations. And, you know, this is having an impact on, on the broader culture. And so I mm -hmm. think it's, it's, it's a positive, it's a greatness, a beautiful thing. And thank you so much, uh, Brother Dennis, for bringing Dr. Gerald Horn on your show. Oh, yeah. I'm going to get him back, man. As, as y'all know, I was a little late. He had said 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. I only had him for 15 minutes, man, because by the time I got ready, you know, he's a busy man. So I appreciate him being here. Uh, and that little bit is enough for us to digest. I'd like to have him here longer, but he kind of went over briefly uh, what he had to say. But it was an honor to have him, just like having Judge Joe Brown. I got another surprise for y'all coming tomorrow, man, but um, a real big one. I'm, I'm excited about it. When you get your heroes up here to talk to you, but uh, in the meantime, in the meantime, y'all make sure y'all check out 
Green Gorillas channel. Love that logo. I need to get some some fancy like that for myself, man. But the blizzard and stuff like that. But uh, thanks so much, <laughs> GG. Hey man, I appreciate just, you, brother. All good right, good talking to you, bro. Yes, sir. Welcome back anytime. Shout out to the G with the PhD. All right, man. Y'all make sure y'all hit the number one button. I'm so ashamed of y'all. Okay. I'm so ashamed of y'all that we don't have a whole lot. I appreciate the donations, and the donations are cool. But I love for you all to see these things live because whether or not I read your comments live or not, I'm looking at them. And I, and I love to see the response and the reaction to you guys, you know, and I just didn't get enough from y'all, man. I want y'all to get this, man. Get the, come on, come tap in on this, man. When you got, you had Gerald Horn in here, you know, Dr. Gerald Horn, the man got a PhD and a JD. You understand what I'm saying? He's a national treasure. And, uh, you know, all we got was just a few people in here. And then we got G with the PhD up in here. Y'all got to do better, man. But here's the thing. You know, we talked about some things, and here's the thing. I wanted to bring him in as an outsider to the YouTube streets, and we talked about reparations, and we talked about uh, the transatlantic slave trade, right? And then after that, you heard me and and the Green Gorilla talk about, um, you know, race relations, generally speaking. Uh, and none of this stuff was radical. You understand? This is all well-known, well-documented information. But what did you hear? The transatlantic slave trade happened. Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Horn mentioned the fact that Ivan Van Sertima said, yeah, you got the Olmec heads down there. And yes, there could have very well been Africans that came over, but not in the millions, not in the number of the millions, just because a couple came over here you know, very early on in the 11th, 12th, 13th century don't mean that the Africans that are here now are, are derived from those people, not in some great number. The vast majority of African Americans that are in this country right now are here because of the transatlantic slave trade. So when you have people on this internet telling you, oh no, we're Indians, that's just denial, it's a lie. It's a lie, it's a lie, it's a lie to keep you bewildered and confused. And we gotta get over that. We gotta stop running away from the truth. The sign of maturity is when you can accept the truth and begin to deal with the truth as it is. Now, as far as our enslavement, white people were enslaved. They have a country called Yugoslavia, <laughs> right? Because what? They, that name was synonymous with slave. All sorts of people were enslaved, Europeans, Asians. It was a predominant part of ancient culture, period. So when you got people on here telling you that, you know, you should be, a, say you were probably a slave too. I'm absolutely certain that we looked into your history. It's there. It was just a condition. Now the slavery that we're dealing with here in the United States, it was unique in that it was lifetime. It was generational. You couldn't escape from it. You were property. But there are elements of all that everywhere. Arab slavery is cruel too. It's cruel now. And it was cruel the 1600 years before uh, white folks even came to uh, Africa and started the transatlantic slave trade. But the bottom line is that's no reason to ignore history. Now, moving forward, I explained to you guys the breeding farms. Dr. Horn has a great special on that. Deal with it. Accept it. But stop listening to people who don't have your best interest at heart. Anybody who will lie to you like that and will tell you that you're derived from Indians and stuff, they're just lying to you. They're trying to scam you, make you feel better. I'm not here to make you feel better. If that's what you want, I mean, those to me, those people, those are like the black men who lie to black women and pander to them. And you see how far that's gotten them. These same preachers and folks who pander to these black American women have got them to the point now that the most obese group of women in America, the most unmarriageable group of women in America, the most out of wedlock group of women in America. That's what pandering does. And these same hotel people that are peddling this Native Americanist stuff, man, bro, that's where you headed to. You're headed for a land of delusion. 
And I can't deal with people who are delusional. You're just going to die. You're just going to fall by the wayside. You're going to live in that lie and you're going to fall by the wayside. We have to deal with truth. We are an African people. But as the G with the PhD said, we're an amalgamation. We're hybrid people. It is what it is. That's it. The vast majority of you, you have absolutely no Native American in you. That's a small, tiny percentage. Understand that. It would be great to say, oh, I'm part Native American. It will make you feel better about the fact. Well, what about the other part? You 10% Native American. What about that 90% African you are? What about those ancestors? <laughs> You're going to ignore them? You're going to ignore what they had to deal with? I'm just saying, family. Um, hit the number one button, man. Show your appreciation. We're going to do a quick roll call because that's what we do here, man. Y'all make sure you check in. And I'm going to be right back, man. Check in, though, man. Represent where you're from. We'll be right back. Hey, I'm about to show you Broadcast, man. It's good to have everybody in here, man. I hope y'all have enjoyed this broadcast. Hit the number one button. Let's go ahead and give a shout out to all my people, man. Let's see where y'all checking in from. We got Nigeria up in here, man. We got uh, Louisiana. Who else we got up in here, man? The Bay Area, Savannah, Georgia. That's what's happening. Uh, who else we got, man? We got uh, London up in here. And of course, H Town, DC. Shout out to everybody, man, who checked in, man. I appreciate y'all, man. Y'all enjoy the broadcast? You enjoy the broadcast? Hit the number one button, man. Show your appreciation. And making sure you hit the thumbs up. Please share this. You know, please share this. Um, I'm not going to believe the point. We had some great folks in here. It's been a great week. You know, you guys saw some great people in here. You, uh, you saw Dr. Uh, Horn tonight. You had an opportunity to interact with uh, Judge Joe Brown. I got a real good one for you coming tomorrow. I think y'all going to really appreciate that, man. But uh, feel free to take this share. You can clip part of it. I don't care, man. Take this wisdom. I'm not one of these people. As long as you're out there doing positive with my work, I don't have a, a problem with you taking it. You know, I take my talking points, steal them. You know, you can call yourself the Blizzard King if you want to. I don't care, baby. You can call yourself Uncle D, D+. Plus. I don't care, man. I want you all to be better human beings. Please take this information. Shout out to Ms. Chardre. Always good to have you in here. Um, good, to, good to see you. Uh, Shay Chardre, she's a young lady. I see your channels out there blowing up. She's one of these young, young married women. Y'all don't be running over to her channel trying to holler at her. But uh, Shay, if you want to come in for a minute and introduce yourself to my uh, my folks, you're welcome to come in. I'd love to have you here. I, I'm, I'm, you know, from my... Um, vantage point over here i am watching your progress and some of you other ladies i'm actually becoming a fan of some of the ladies who have infiltrated the manosphere and uh i am i do have some of my favorites so shay if you want to come in here uh you're welcome to come in here and kind of introduce people to who you are we got a little time in here love to have you come in here if your hair is not fixed 
that's all right. We we take you how y'all. The link is in the chat room for you. But in the meantime, um, you guys, uh, what's going to happen is what's going to happen. And what do I mean by that? Like, you know, I, what we know now is the African American community is changing, and um, honestly. <laughs> these brothers are going to go overseas, right? And there's going to be a significant number who's going to stay. Um, but the vast majority of these black men, when they go overseas, they're going to come back with their, their, their wives. And they're going to move back into those same black neighborhoods where they've lived. They're going to move back into the same black community. There's only so many different places you can live, right? So what does that mean? <clears throat> that means they're going to move their Colombian wives, their West Indian wives. Uh, they're going to move them all right back into the black community that we call the black community now. And so it's not like they're going to go overseas and stay. So for those lovely ladies who are saying, Oh, you passport bros go. No, they're going to go and then they're going to come back. But what's going to happen is those children that they have by those women are going to be culturally different than the African-American children that we become. And, and they're going to have a different culture than the African-American people that we have now. And I think that's healthy. Now, I tell you folks all the time. You know, I don't care who you marry, but I'm going to tell you the same thing I tell my sons. I'd love for you to marry women of African descent. Not that I'm going to hold you to only dating black women. You know, I mean, you love who you love. God bless you as long as you find a woman who supports you 100%. But what we're looking at now is the black American community is not going to exist in 50 or 60 years. It's just not going to be here because the young brothers are dating out. You got 54% of black men who aren't married and aren't having children. So that says a lot. And, you know, if you're holding out right now for something better to come along or for that right sister to come along and you're limiting yourself to black women who live in the United States, you're going to have a problem. Like I told you guys a couple of weeks ago, man, go get yourself a real black woman from the motherland if that's what you like. Go get yourself a beautiful Ghanaian wife or a beautiful woman from the Congo or, or Sudan or Ethiopia, or Eritrea, Nigeria. They're beautiful African women all over the planet. Brazil, Belize, Guyana, Jamaica, Haiti, Dominican Republic. I want you men to get married because I want you to take those women and bring them back here to this United States and begin to help heal this culture. The way I call African-American culture as it is right now, toxic. And the reason I refer to it as toxic is because it is, because it's a culture that does not produce the results necessary for we as a people to move forward into the future. In other words, your, the culture is supposed to answer questions. And that number one question is, how do we move forward into the future as a people? And if our culture says, destroy yourself and turn within and hate yourselves, guess what that's doing? That's a toxic culture. In order to heal that culture and also remain the African people that we are, guess what we need to do? You brothers, take the initiative. Find you some African women. Find black women. Bring them over here. Look, and this just doesn't go just for black men. I want white men to marry white women. You understand? Asian men to marry Asian women. This is, I'm just saying, it's easier that way. But if you love somebody, fine. You know, that's all I'm saying. I'm not pushy like that. I'm not trying to tell you who to be with. Because I'd rather you be with somebody you love that might be of a different ethnicity, a different race, and try to be with somebody that you can't get along with. And then you just make more broken marriages. That's where I'm at. 
Okay, but bottom line is, hey, this is this is my thoughts. I'm trying to wait for Shay to come up in here. Uh, Miss Miss Chardre, I'm I'm waiting for you now, sister. I know it's last minute, but you've been called up. You've been called up now. Come on up in here. Let's see if we can get in here. But in the meantime, man, y'all hit the number one button. Show your appreciation. I see my man 8020 up in here. Y'all, I hope y'all been checking out his channel. It's called Simple Shit. Uh, I want to see his channel grow, too. You know, I want to see that. Channel, Look at this beautiful, beautiful woman who has come uh, here today. Uh, we got to uh, say hi to everybody. Back. Welcome. How are you today, man? <laughs> welcome, hey. welcome, welcome. Hey, hey, hey. Y'all, let's give her a hand. Look, <laughs> women don't come in this channel. They scared. They think I'm a... <laughs> <laughs> very rarely and the only ones we get in there they're ugly we get a lot of ugly women very rarely, <laughs> you know, that's all we get is ugly women man they come up here and want to fight they i guess i'm the type they want to fight with you know but uh truth be anyway. told i get it too i ain't gonna lie you I get get it too. yeah well introduce yourself they don't know your channel is blowing up over here look at this man you got all these people go oh, yeah, ahead you, you deep around here man look look <laughs> But introduce them to yourself, man. Let them know who you are, ma'am. Yeah, well, again, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Shay Shirley. Do you hear some feedback? Uh, you might have to unmute your, uh, you, you You probably got to mute your YouTube because I can hear a little bit. Yeah. Okay, let me, you know what? I think I had, okay, you know what? I had something else open. So let me try that again. So Shay Shirley here. Um, I run a, a channel on these streets and um we talk about a lot of stuff femininity um black community lifestyle spirituality one of the things that i'm really excited about is a series that i launched um a couple of weeks ago called how to be a wife and mm. the emphasis is really creating a, an alternative space for women who don't necessarily want to do the whole feel for hot go summer mm. FNF, uh you know uh lifestyle and want an alternative space to talk to women who actually believe in marriage and believe in family and actually want to learn how to do so. I do believe that <laughs> if to be family minded is something that you're supposed to learn at home, but most yeah. black women, unfortunately don't necessarily didn't grow up with that opportunity. So okay. started to create a space where we can at least start to have these conversations. And I bring in different wives who have actually been married, not like boss babe coaches who teach femininity and have no results. Women who have been married for decades, who have kids, my age, grandkids, who can right. um, give us the nitty gritty on what it actually means to raise a household. So that's something I'm really excited about. We also do trending events and other different things. I actually just got off a live a few minutes ago. We talked about this subject. I was interviewing, I'm Courtney Michelle, and she mm -hmm. was talking about STAB, how she believes that she can get Black American men back to be with Black American women. So <laughs> ah, <I got> it. <laughs> You laughed. You laughed. Back. Come back to what? Don't get me started up in here. Come back. Well, hey, that look, was the, that was the let conversation. Me, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Like, <laughs> but, but, but uh, fun, humorously, the first thing these brothers said was, "Hmm, natural hair and collarbones and fit." They can't even get that. You see what I mean? But look, this That's woman is bad. married already. If there was uh, twenty million. Miss Chardray's up in here. You might stand a chance, but as long as you got these big wide back Bertha's up in here, ain't nobody coming back to that. What's wrong with you? Are you kidding me? Who wants to deal with ugly all goddamn day for the rest of it? Ugly and grumpy and bad built and hostile with a bunch of side kids. We don't want to deal with that. Go ahead. Let, but let's hear your argument. Let's go ahead. The floor no, is yours. Like all I can say is that it's it's sad to me that something to me that is so bare minimum is evidently like hard to come across i mean mm -hmm. having your natural hair and trying to have a healthy body to me that's to me that doesn't seem like it should be that difficult uh to find but I, mean, I know now you're gonna make them fat i mean i'm, I'm sorry that you'll make those larger ladies angry <laughs> with you by saying that hey listen larger I ladies believe that you should accept them as they are or otherwise you're either fat shaming them or superficial okay I was an overweight kid. Mm -hmm. I was the fat kid in the class. So uh, people don't believe that now, but it's like, I, my family, uh, people in my family are very big bone. Put it that way. I'm trying to be nice. Um, and so I didn't grow up with, you know, necessarily lean. 
I mm. made the decision to, at a certain point where it's just like I didn't like the way I felt. I didn't like, like the way I looked. And um, but I still have I still have family in my, you know, who struggle with their weight, who, you know, have issues. So I'm never one to necessarily shame a person for where they're at. I'm just more mm. like, what are the results that you want? If you right. want to get a particular man um, and you're looking this way then you kind of just have to know where you rank. So it's not about shaming, like telling the truth or being honest about what, um, you know, men want or what the person that you want wants. That's not shaming. That's just reality. Like nobody's mm -hmm. trying to be a manager at Google with a high school degree. You're going to get a college degree and work hard and do different things if you want to be a manager at Google. So we get this. What, in like what, what, do you, what do you say to these lovely ladies <laughs> who tell you, that these men are not worth doing anything for. What do you tell them? What do, what do you tell? Because that's what we get a lot. I'm, they need to take me how I am. They look at, it's almost like they have an attitude that says that uh, they're not worth me making myself better for. And then they get mad when we go get us one of these fine Afro-Latinas or one of these fine, tall, beautiful Viking white women like 80-20. I don't know if you know Alvin up in here. Alvin, I know somewhere he's, he's, he's he got a fine, tall volleyball playing Viking woman that, that cooks and cleans for him every day. <laughs> Blonde hair, blue eyes with a little Viking helmet on. How do you convince us to leave those beautiful women alone to come back to the black community? You, you don't. Know, <laughs> you don't. You, you don't. They, they, yeah, there it is. That's what, what I, I got. That's what yeah. I know. That's what I, we had that conversation and I told, I was like, Courtney, you know, I'm, I'm with you as far as trying to be a part of the solution. And mm -hmm. also, I'm not going to hold black men hostage to try to wait for a generation of women or wait for women to one day wake up. If they see a good or better option, then they should take it. So mm -hmm. that to me, I, I have I have no issues to men who feel like their best option is to literally inconvenience themselves and go abroad to another country. Like, think about that. If it's so bad where men feel like we have to literally integrate into another culture, another mm -hmm. country just to find good women, it's like we got to own that. It's just yeah. my personal opinion. There it is. I'm going to have to have you back sometime. We're going to have the ladies' day here. But uh, in the meantime, folks, this, this young woman is brilliant. She's a married woman. She has uh, a great uh, a great voice, and she's talking to women. Fellas, I know. Y'all like hearing from me. I don't talk to women. So all you <laughs> ladies, you want to hear what they got? I don't talk to you because I don't speak your language. You're going to get mad at me anyway. That's why y'all don't come up in here. When you come up in here, I cross-examine you, make you mad. Y'all call me mean names. They had to stop using my name because I got a trademark and I've been flagging people who use my name. Oh, and wow. so now they just call me the bad, bad man. And I'm okay with that. <laughs> but here's a nice, nice lady for you all to check out. She has 12,300 followers, subscribers. I'd like for you ladies and you gentlemen to go over here and subscribe to the channel, show your appreciation for her hard work. And uh, other than that, man, y'all can see where she at. But uh, in the meantime, I want to thank you, Shay, for coming through. Did yeah. I pronounce your guy? I always butcher your name. Is, is it Shay Chardre? Uh, it's she, it's Shay Chardre, but I've heard it's, it's, it's too French. It's too French for me. You need, <laughs> we need to just call you Bonquisha or Laquilla. <laughs> I'm just kidding. God bless you, sister. It's great having you here, man. You're going to come over there and hang out. Invite me over there. Let me come over there and run some of your subscribers away. Like, let me come over there and talk loud to some of the people someday. Yeah, no, you are well. I'd love to have you over. You're welcome. There's actually quite a few subjects that I would. Love send, me, send me a send me a link. I'm gonna come through. I'm gonna come through with my boots on and okay. be angry. <laughs> but anyway, God bless you. Have okay. a great day. You take care. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right. Hey, you know we two hours in, and you know what time it is, man. Y'all hit the number one button. Show your appreciation. Shout out to Doctor Horn. Shout out to the G with the PhD. Shout out to Miss Chardre, man. As I say all night, it's been kind of like a hodgepodge of conversation, but it is what it is. We trying to just go with the flow, man. God bless y'all. I appreciate y'all. Reread this. Listen to it. Follow, uh, you know, go find Dr. Horn. Find the G with the PhD. Find these folks. I'm, I'm happy to be the conduit for you to get this new information. But other than that, as I always said this time, man, it's been a blessing. God bless you. I'm out. <laughs>